Welcome to the final installment of our spring quarter 2021 class, Resisting Satan. Our theme verse for this class has been James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Last week we talked about that resistance beginning with a humble submission to God. When we start there, we can be confident in the face of Satan's schemes. Confident, but not arrogant. And confidence can easily slip into arrogance. Arrogance would be moving away from the humility that Christ showed us in his life as an example. He is the reason for our confidence. And that brings us to this week's lesson, Take Heed Lest You Fall. We've got to remain on guard against Satan and his ways. The phrase, Take Heed Lest You Fall, is derived from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's take a step back into chapter 9 of that letter, beginning in verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Even Paul had to remain on guard against Satan, lest he provide that that devil with an opportunity to entice him away from Christ. We need to have the same kind of self-discipline as an athlete preparing for and participating in a race. We can't let up. And for this race, there is no off-season. Continuing in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. The Israelites of Exodus were saved from slavery in Egypt, witnessing miraculous plagues that led to their release, walking on dry land across the parted Red Sea, following a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Can you imagine seeing and experiencing all of that? Even their food and water was provided miraculously. And yet, most of them did not continue to trustingly, humbly submit to God. Instead of overcoming, they were overcome. What happened? Continuing in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. They allowed all of these things to come between them and the God who had so powerfully and dramatically won their freedom. Are we going to follow their example or be warned by it? Again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, they did not find themselves in a luxury spa resort. They were in the wilderness. They very clearly needed God to provide for them there. You would think, having witnessed what they witnessed, that they could trust God to do just that. But they despaired, and they grumbled, and they complained, and were not faithful. And what we have in Christ, freedom from slavery to sin, the promise of not an earthly home but a heavenly heavenly one, is much greater 
than what they had in their release from Egyptian slavery in the promise of the territory of Canaan. We have even more reason to trust in God and to submit to Him and His ways. Similarly, in the letter to the Romans, Paul warned Gentile believers to not have an arrogant attitude toward Jewish unbelievers. He compares them both to branches of an olive tree. The unbelieving were cut off, and the new believers were grafted in. Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 18. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. There remained the possibility of losing what they had gained in Christ. Pride and arrogance could bring about that loss, and it can cause us to fall still today. Look at what Peter says about those baptized believers who abandoned the teaching of the apostles in exchange for a doctrine more suited to their desires. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20-22 through 22. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. We must not become lax in our Christian walk, because then we become susceptible to false teachings like those Peter was writing about. We must guard against a comfortable arrogance that overcame many Jews in their status as the people of God. Uh, as we read in Romans chapter 2, but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know His will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? Those who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. They heard the law, they taught the law, but they didn't do the law. And so they were guilty we must avoid that very human pattern. Those who were considered the greatest students and teachers of the law ended up twisting it. In what began as an effort to keep themselves within the law, they instead moved away from God and His ways, substituting their own teaching and wisdom for the wisdom of God. And the same thing happens in the church today. Consider what Paul said to the elders of the Ephesian church in Acts chapter 20. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God, which He obtained with His own blood. I know that after my departure fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. We can be led away by false messages that sound good, but are not from God. Messages that twist Scripture to justify worldly practices instead of the way of the Spirit. Consider also how we might fall away like those illustrated by the parable of the sower and the seed that fell on rocky soil and on the, or the seed that fell among the thorns. From Matthew chapter 13. 
As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. And for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Thankfully, God makes it possible for us to improve our soil conditions. We don't have to be content with rocks and thorns. We can be free of those restrictions and so be ready to withstand the scorching heat of the troubles of this world, even persecution for our faith, and to not be distracted from Christ by politics or finances or any other worldly cares. We have to maintain a heavenly, godly perspective against the worldly perspective that is all around us. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15-17 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. And so, we have to pay attention, to take heed. We have to examine ourselves. As Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? Examine and test. Uh, am I in the faith? Am I living like Jesus Christ is in me? Is there evidence of His presence in the way I live? Have I failed to meet the test? Do I live up to the call of James chapter 1? But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. The standard is found in the Word of God. We have to know it and we have to live it. We have to measure ourselves against the Word in humility. Romans chapter 12, verse 3, For by the grace given to me I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith, that God has assigned. We need to make sure that we are not hypocrites, that we act out of love for Christ and for our brothers and sisters in Him, that we aren't putting on a show to gain the esteem of others. Luke chapter 8, 18, beginning in verse 9. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. We must be careful to make an honest assessment of ourselves in the light of God's Word, and to vigilantly continue that assessment throughout our lives, never becoming complacent. Complacency leaves us vulnerable to Satan's deceit. So we need to take heed lest we fall.